that kept on going, and that's why penicillin doesn't really work as well as it used to. Eric Levine is pushing his 10th grade students to think deeply about the content of their learning expedition by using a science talk. Also horizontal gene transfer. The gene from one bacteria, they have the antibiotic resistance gene, goes into the other bacteria. To piggyback on what everyone else is saying, um, a quote that I got from Source A Four. science talk provides an opportunity for students to practice thinking and speaking like a scientist, using evidence from complex texts, original research, and authentic data. It can come to the point where we can't stop the infection, so it's a global threat. In this video, we are focusing on three strategies, establishing norms and goals, selecting a compelling topic, and sequencing questions. One of the important things that we do before we start the science talk is to remind students of the norms. Take a second to recall a chart that we made, talking, thinking, and writing like a scientist. So I'm going to ask... Each time we read an article or watched a video, we took time to dissect how the person was presenting information, and that became our anchor chart for ourselves when we were building our own skills. Deja, what do you think? Why is it reliable to show data over and over and over again, and it's not as reliable to show it once. If you show it once, it could have been just like a fluke that it happened that one time, but if you have it multiple times, it shows that it's a consistent thing that's happening. We're gonna set a quick goal about talking like a scientist. So see where it says the one, two, three. My goal is to provide evidence and build off each other's ideas. My goal is to use scientific vocabulary when I talk. I wanna focus on providing evidence. Selecting a compelling topic for a science talk is instrumental in engaging students. For this, Eric drew from the 10th graders' recent learning expedition. Our expedition is called Resistance. It's focused on the global problem of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So students did original research during this expedition. We um, took samples from around the school, for example, in the locker rooms, in the gym, in the bathrooms, and in the lunchroom. We looked at how much bacterial growth there was and how much of that was resistant to antibiotics. There was, there was quite a bit of resistance, which was really surprising to me and definitely surprising to the students. We found that about 33% of the bacteria was resistant to antibiotics. With a compelling topic at hand and a clear picture of norms and goals, Eric's students were ready to engage in a science talk. So up here on the board, there's a claim, there's some guiding questions. We'll come Strategically back to designing and sequencing um, questions is key to the effectiveness of science talks. I wanted students to start by talking big picture about the issue, to get kids caught up about what they were supposed to know. Then I wanted to really focus on the data, and then I really wanted kids to be in a place where they could talk about, so what, what's important about this issue? First guiding question that we're going to talk about is, is antibiotic resistance a global threat? Why? How do we know? To prove that it's um, globally a threat is from source three, the threat of antibiotic resistance. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 2013. 23,000 people die each year as a result. Once I felt like the students had presented enough evidence and information about the first question, we were ready to move on to the second, where we could look really specifically at our data. Um, I noticed that where we clean the most and where we care for the most, like the gym and then the bathroom, the nurse's office, have more antibiotic resistance due to the fact that all the cleaning material used has ingredients that we put in antibiotics. Here it says that a very B was the plate with the moxicillin, and there was 34.57% growth. So that means 34% of the bacteria that we collected in our own school is resistant to amoxicillin. So after we talked about our data in the school and how it related to us, it was time to solve the problem and talk about what solutions there were. What can scientists, politicians, and the public do about antibiotic resistance? Like for a solution, like if you look at the states below us, they like use more antibiotics a lot more. They have more antibiotic resistance than us, so they could kind of like like ask Massachusetts like what they do to help like lower antibiotic resistance, and then we can ask states who have lower antibiotic resistance than we do, and we can follow the lead of the states who have lower antibiotic resistance. Um, one thing the government can do is have tighter regulations, since there's data that shows antibiotic use that there's more in certain states then they should have regulations. They should check in with the doctors that are using it there. Also in, um, in our farm. Our teachers are holding us to a high standard. My fellow classmates and I have gotten so good at being academically oriented um, because we've been doing this since sixth grade. For me, thinking like a scientist means taking in what others are saying and reflecting on it and saying what we think about that. I am thinking more like a scientist during a science talk because 
I use the uh, I use relevant information what scientists use. I use data and I um, use what I researched. So like if a doctor prescribes penicillin to um, another patient that doesn't need the penicillin, they, they listened well and performed to or beyond the expectations that I had for them. And I think it was a very authentic way for them to culminate the expedition. It made the issue real for them. On the back of your science talk response guide in the exit slip area, take a minute to reflect on your ability to contribute to the conversation and to support our claim, furthering our understanding of the problem.